I am joined now by Ramesh. He is the 2018 MRS Spring Meeting Plenary Speaker who is delivering the Fred Cavley Distinguished Lectureship in Material Science Talk. Thank you so much for being Thank with you, us. Yeah. Before we dig into your plenary address, let's talk a little bit about your work. You've made landmark contributions in the field of ferroelectrics. Tell us a little bit about the work you've done along the way. Thank you. Yeah, so I've been working in this field for about 30 years. Like many people in my generation, we all were enthralled by the emergence of high temperature superconductivity. These are complex materials. They have many atoms in it, but the particular system is based on copper oxide. So I cut my teeth through MRS, which is a central figure in our research. I cut my, my teeth on the cuprates, and then I was working in Belcor, this is way back in the late 80s, where there was a very interesting problem on information storage. How do you make a certain kind of memory device? And that's the one that you mentioned, the ferroelectric memory device. And so we got into it with some hypotheses and to try to solve a 30-year-old problem. It turns out like human beings, these materials get tired, they fatigue. And the question was, how do you prevent fatigue from happening? And so we discovered a pathway by which you could use oxide metals to make them not fatigue. And that was a, a, a turning point in that field because now you could make a device, a ferroelectric memory device, that would be very robust. From the application perspective, that was an, a key uh, discovery. Were there any mentors or notable figures who helped guide you oh, along absolutely. the way? Absolutely. Um, Isaac Newton, in his uh, uh, one of his uh, talks, uh, he mentions that we are able to see far because we stand on the shoulders of giants. Mm -hmm. and I mentioned it in my talk today as well. Uh, there were a lot of mentors. There still are so many mentors within my professional organization. Uh, within the community. And we talked about Von Hippel. Professor Von Hippel was a giant in the field of oxides way back in the 1940s. Ted Jabal, who is still alive at 95 and doing research at Stanford, uh, he was a giant uh, in Bell Labs when he was there working on oxides. Uh, John Goodenough, who is 95 and hale and healthy and very active in the energy storage business, the batteries. He was a great, he is a mentor to us. And of course, Professor Cross, Eric Cross, he passed away about a year ago at Penn State uh, in the field of ferroelectrics, these are giants. Mm -hmm. And so I've had a lot of people as mentors. There are people who come in and uh, make pointers to say, hmm, have you thought about it this way? Then you go back and say, oh yeah, I need to think about this. Mm -hmm. And so I've had a lot of mentors. Many of them have been very influential in my career taking all the turns and twists as I'm evolving. Yeah. You mentioned your talk. Can you give us an overview of what you talked about, what you C discussed? Certainly, yeah. So if you look at this, this field of oxides, uh, there is a very interesting problem which has now gotten a lot of uh, interest from industry. Intel is involved in this. It has to do with a very complicated physics problem which says, how do I control magnetism with an electric field. And these are, uh, in very simple analogies, these are like your twin children, very different personalities, very different quantum mechanical quantities. And typically, they don't couple very well with each other. So the question is, how do you make them couple? How do you discover materials that would couple? Beyond that, you say, hmm, why would I do this? One reason to do it is because uh, electric fields in very small dimensions can lead to much lower energy consumption compared to a magnetic field, in principle. And so this is where our colleagues at Intel come into the picture. Intel has been pushing very hard for the last two to three years on discovering the next switch to replace silicon-based CMOS. And this has now become a very urgent activity for the entire community. And so um, it turns out that they identified that the kinds of materials that we work on called magnetoelectrics would be ideal for this. And so the talk was primarily, the first part of the talk was putting oxide materials into perspective. 
because this was a, a kind of a plenary lecture, we had to give overview of how the field is evolving. And the second part of the talk was very much focused on this one problem. How do you do it in a way that you can actually get to a, an energy scale which is significantly lower than today, but at the same time not make mistakes about these physical quantities? And you have to be very careful because in nature they obey different laws. Mm -hmm. And so to couple them, one has to be very thoughtful. That was the essence of the talk. You mentioned uh, perovskite in your talk abstract. Right. Where are we in understanding this particular topic? What are some of the challenges still to overcome? And what are the potential benefits of continued research in this area? Uh, that's a great question. Now, perovskites have been, you know, this compound perovskite itself is a natural mineral. It's been mined in, in a town in, in Russia. And so this is not a new material. And there's been hundreds of compounds, maybe even a few thousand compounds uh, within that broad family. Um, many of them have different physical properties. Some of them are magnetic, some of them are insulators, some of them are superconductors, some of them have very interesting piezoelectric properties. Indeed, MRS is the home for this compound because there have been numerous symposia over the last 20, 25 years focusing on each one of those physical properties. Now coming to this particular perovskite, which is a bismuth iron oxide, it, it happens to be the poster child for this particular field because it has most of the attributes that you would like for it to become real technology. Now having said that, going from a scientific discovery to a real product has many steps. One has to take it from the science part and then translate it into something that would look at like early stage development. And from there, you have to look at the markets. The market needs to be able to sustain a new product. And this is, was my ending slide in my talk, that typically new technologies in a, a market which is a commodity market, solar for example, or memory devices, they're all commodities. Therefore, the margins are very small. So a new technology to break into a, a commodity market is a lot more difficult than a new technology to break into a non-commodity market where the margins are much larger. So one has to go through that evolution. I think MRS is a perfect environment for that. You, know, you can do the science, you do the technology development, you can do the translation to industry. Well, thank you, Ramesh. We yeah. appreciate it and thank you so thank much. You Congratulations so much, yeah. on you. your uh, yeah. speech. Yeah. We appreciate it. Thanks.